Jesus the Christ, son of the living God, at the end of his public ministry in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18, the Bible specifically says that he comes to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. When he gets to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples two critical questions. The first question that he asked his disciples is, who do men say that I am? The son of man am. In other words, Jesus is getting ready to leave this world in physical form. But before he leaves this world in physical form, he asks his disciples, I want to know what other people are saying about me. All of the disciples are able to tell Jesus what other people say about Jesus. Some say you were John the Baptist. Some say you were Jeremiah. Some say you are Elijah or one of the great prophets. But the second critical question that he asked, forget what everybody else is saying about me, but whom do you say that I am? Out of all of the disciples who ran with Jesus, rode with Jesus, ate with Jesus, and talked with Jesus for three entire years, you would think that they would know him for themselves, but only one out of the twelve is able to answer this question. The question is so critical, not because of what he asked, but because of who he's talking to. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Amongst the disciples at this particular moment in time was a former tax collector by the name of Matthew and after Jesus asked this question when it is that Jesus leaves this world in physical form Matthew will go on to write the gospel of Matthew among the disciples is not just Matthew but there's another disciple we call him loud mouth cussing Peter Peter had a cussing problem Peter had anger management issues but failure is not final he asked this question to the same Peter who's getting ready to preach on the day of Pentecost and after his message on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter number 2 3,000 souls not counting the women and the children will be added to the church and the first mega church in the history of the entire world is getting ready to be birthed. Peter is not just in the group. Matthew is not just in the group but John the beloved disciple is inside of this group. John wrote the gospel of John but he also wrote 1st, 2nd and 3rd John and the the rest of the disciples who are in this group are witnesses on the day of Pentecost. The question is so critical, not because of what he says, but because of who he's talking to. He's talking to the future leaders of his New Testament early church. And if the leadership does not get the answer to this question right, then Peter would have been preaching about a God that he did not know. Matthew would have been writing about a God that he really did not know. John would have been writing about a God that he did not know. And the rest of the disciples would have been witnessing on Pentecost about a God they really didn't know. Before we point the finger at the disciples for not being able to answer the question, how many of us in 2016 are preaching but preaching about a Jesus we've never met? How many of us are singing but singing about a Jesus that we really don't know for ourselves? How many people are serving but serving a Jesus that we really don't know? How many people are worshiping a Jesus that we've yet to meet for ourselves? Many of us are just like the disciples. You know what mama said about them. You know what daddy said about them. You know what grandmama said about them. But there comes a moment in time in all of our lives when what mama said is not good enough God has a way of allowing you to get inside of a situation you gotta know God for yourself somebody shout I know him for myself I really believe that's why the old people said that, that I'm satisfied with Jesus I'm satisfied with Jesus where you're satisfied with Jesus in my heart and when it got real good to them they turned around and said you can't make me doubt him they said that I know too much about him. I know too much about him in my heart. Somebody shout, I know him for myself. It is quite interesting to note only one out of the 12 of the disciples are able to answer the question out of all of the people who answered it. It is Simon. Simon steps up in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. He says, thou art the Christ. 
You are not just a great prophet. You are not just a great teacher. You are not just a great rabbi, but you are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the Messiah. You are the Savior of the world. And as soon as Simon recognizes who G Jesus is and calls him the Christ, Jesus turns around in Matthew chapter number 16, verse 18, and tells Simon who he is. Jesus says, and thou art Peter. He changes his name from Simon to Peter, gives him a purpose, gives him a will and a plan for his life. Peter means Petros, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What amazes me about this particular scripture is that Simon recognizes who Jesus is. Jesus turns around and tells Simon who he is. Simon says, Jesus, you are not just Jesus because many people are named Jesus, but you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the anointed one. You are the Savior of the world. And as soon as Simon tells Jesus who he is, Jesus turns right around and tells Simon who he is is and thou art Peter what that says to all of us you can never know who you are until you know who Christ is somebody just missed it I, I think I'll say that again you can never know who you are until you know who Christ is the more we seek to know Christ the more he reveals to us about who it is we are supposed to be, what it is we are supposed to do, his will, his plan, and his purpose for our lives. And many of us are in church and have been in church for 25 plus years, but just because you have been in church all of this time does not mean that you know who Jesus is for yourself. But the more I know Jesus for myself, the more I know who I am and whom God has ordained for me to be. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I want to I want to uh, stake my hat right here. He says, and thou art Peter. Everybody say Peter. Peter. He says, and upon this rock, I will build. Somebody say my church. My church. Somebody say it again. My church. You mean to tell me that Jesus says the church does not belong to the pastor, but he said my church. Church doesn't belong to the deacons, but he said my church. Church does not belong to the choir, but he said my church. Church does not belong to those who sit inside of the pews, but he said my church. If you don't get nothing else from this message, if you don't get nothing else from this series, who stole my church? Put it on the screen so everybody can see it. The church belongs to Christ. Everybody, let's read that together with uplifted voices. One, two, ready, read. Read. The church belongs to Christ. And because the church belongs to Christ, we cannot take Christ's church, do what we want to do with his church, then stick his name on it and expect for him to bless it. Somebody just missed it. I think I'll say it again. I cannot take God's church, do what I want to do with God's church, stick God's name on it, and expect for him to bless it. So if you don't get anything else from this message, this whole series stems from this particular scripture, the way I'm framing it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus says that upon this rock I will build my church. The church belongs to Christ. I love the church, but it doesn't belong to Pastor Beavers. Deacons love the church, but it doesn't belong to the deacons. Choir members love the church, it doesn't belong to them. But the church belongs to Christ. Nevertheless, because the church belongs to Christ, the question has to be raised, why in the world do we even ask the question, who stole my church? Because it is impossible to steal something from you that ain't yours in the first place. So somebody just missed it. I, I think I'll say it again. It's impossible for somebody to steal something from me that does not belong to me in the first place. Nevertheless, even though the church belongs to Christ, many of us, even in 2016 at New Rising Star, are dealing with some real feelings because we don't understand change. We are dealing with some real feelings because we don't know how to handle change. I, I know that the church belongs to Christ, but even though I know that the church belongs to Christ, when I see changes and I don't understand why the change, it leaves me walking away with the feeling, who stole my church? Somebody shout, who stole my church? God Almighty, I wish y'all would wake up. It's 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning. I need you to say it to East Lake, Brown Springs, Gate City, and High Chaparral. Hear ya? Somebody say, who stole my church? 
Ladies and gentlemen, many of us, because we do not like change, many of us argue scripture as if God does not change. And the main scripture that we point to is Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 8. Uh, Jesus the same yesterday, <laughs> today, and forevermore. Uh, and then we sing the song, God is a good God. God don't never change. But, but can I pause to tell somebody, scripture without a context is not scripture at all. I'm going to say it again. Scripture without a context is not scripture at all. When the Bible declares Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, it does not mean that his character, watch this, or his methods don't change. What it does mean is that even though his methods change, his character never changes. Can I prove it to you? Okay. Class is now in session. Uh, in the Old Testament, we see the character of God as a forgiving God. In the New Testament, we see the same character of God as a forgiving God. There's forgiveness in the Old Testament for sins. There's forgiveness in the New Testament for sins. However, the way he forgives us from the Old Testament to the New Testament, he switches his method. Somebody say he switches the method. In the Old Testament, for me to be forgiven, I had to bring bulls and goats and lambs and pigeons, and, and I had to kill the animals and slaughter the, uh, sprinkle the blood on the altar. Worship was a bloody mess. Uh, and then I had to go through a man-made priest, and they went to the Holy of Holies uh, once a year in order to atone for the sins of the people. In the New Testament, we get the same forgiveness, but there's a different method. Jesus became our high priest and our perfect sacrifice all at the same time. So when he sacrificed his life on the cross, I get the same forgiveness, but I don't have to go through a man in order to ask for forgiveness. Watch this. I can have a direct connection to God because of my relationship with Jesus the Christ. He's the same forgiving God because his character never changes, but his methods do change. Somebody say his methods do change. Nevertheless, there are some specific changes at New Rising Star that have caused some people to feel like somebody stole my church. So I want to go through some of these changes this morning that, uh, because, because of some of these small, minute changes, people feel we ain't doing it the same way. What's this over here? Uh, it causes people to feel like somebody stole their church. Let's deal with this first change. Let's deal with the elephant inside of the room. If you've been a part of New Rising Star for the past three years, you already know that the way that we do communion has changed. Somebody say it's changed. Somebody say it again. It's changed. It's changed from open trays to prepackaged communion. And a small change like that on the first Sunday has caused some people to feel somebody didn't stole my church. But let me tell you why it changed. Number one, prepackaged communion is more sanitary. You don't even realize somebody walked up to me and said, Pastor, I don't even take communion. I said, You don't take communion? He didn't say we're supposed to do it a certain amount of times, but he did say as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. He said, no, I don't take it because one day I was in the bathroom uh, with somebody, uh, and I saw them using the bathroom, and they were holding themselves, and they walked right out the bathroom on the first Sunday, and they did not wash their hands, and they started passing them little trays around, and he stuck his hand right inside of the tray. Folk around here mad because we got prepackaged communion. Now, you don't even realize I'm trying to prevent a virus from breaking out. <laughs> now that it's prepackaged, I ain't got to worry about where you put your hands. I hope you wash your hands, but I ain't even got to worry. I hope you don't want to shake nobody's hands. Shake the person's hand next to you. Tell them, tell them my hand's clean. Give them a pound if you can't shake it. <laughs> Would you believe somebody stopped taking communion? Because they saw somebody in the bathroom wiping themselves, walked out of the bathroom, didn't wash their hands, and you didn't even know what was going on. So that's one of the reasons for the change. Another reason that we change from open trays to prepackaged communion, watch this, is to help rid this church specifically, New Rising Star of Discord. Everybody say Discord. 
What does this have to do with discord? Every day, uh, every first Sunday when I explain communion, I say that the root word of communion is union. It is where we get our word unity. Uh, if no other day, we are, dis uh, we are to display unity on the day we take communion. Outwardly, we are saying to God that by discerning your body, which is the bread and your blood, which is the wine, Lord, we are one with you. We are one with each other. But would you not believe that there was some discord going on behind the scenes? Uh, there was discord behind the scenes because the way we used to do it, uh, all the ministers and deacons used to stand up in the front uh, and we had on our fine black suit. We were looking good too. Uh, fine black suit, white shirt, black tie, and some Stacy Adams. All of us had them Stacy Adams. Uh, we had on the Stacey Adams, and then all of our ministers' wives and our deacons' wives, uh, they were dressed down to the nine. They had on their beautiful white dresses. They were absolutely beautiful. Uh, and watch this. We would stand up here, and we would serve communion to the people. Uh, we would serve communion to the people, but behind the scenes, there was discord. Why was there discord? Some husbands and wives were arguing with each other, because wives, rightfully so, didn't want to stand up here with everybody. Some wives liked doing it. Some wives did not like doing it. And so, therefore, as a consequence, behind the scenes, they were dreading coming to church on the first Sunday because the only reason I'm up here, I don't even know why I'm doing this. I'm just serving this because I'm the wife of a deacon. I'm just serving this because I am the wife of a minister. Do you not realize that I have always taught and always will teach that we are to serve not where there is a need. We are to serve where we are gifted. Somebody shout where I'm gifted. Well, the ministry of a wife of a deacon and the ministry of a wife of a minister are the only two ministries in our church that never had that privilege. The only reason I got to serve communion it's because my husband is called to preach. Only reason I have to serve communion is because my husband is called to be a deacon. What if I don't have a passion to do this? What if I'm just going through the motions and I ask people why you do it and they don't even know why you do it? I ask people why you cover the table. They say we cover the table because it's more holy. But when I do my research, we didn't cover the table because it's more holy. We covered the table because we used to have church outside and we kept flies away. But that was going on behind the scenes, so to cut all of that out, we have pre-packaged communion uh, because it's more sanitary. Uh, now, no longer do wives and husbands dread coming to church. And don't get me wrong, it was not every wife, it was not every husband. Some of them loved doing it, but you had another group who did not like doing it. So to cut out discord, we made the change of communion and it caused some people to feel like your church has been stolen but now that you know the reason you ought to be able to bear with the change not only did we change communion we changed baptism everybody say baptism <laughs> baptism used to be on Sunday morning 11:30 a.m. in front of everybody we don't even get to see people get baptized no more why get you you just changing everything If you was that interested in baptism, you'll come on Wednesday night when we do it and watch it. Well, why did we change it? We changed it because God started blessing us so much. I mean, he started blessing us so much that we got to the point we were baptizing 15, 20, 25 people, 30 people at a time on Sunday morning. Do you not know that to baptize 15 to 30 people takes about 35 to 45 minutes? Okay, so watch this. We changed it because time is not an issue to some people. It's not an issue to me. I was born and raised in a church. I can stay in church all day long, 7.30, 9 a.m., 11.30. You have an afternoon program. I'm going to come back. We stop having afternoon programs, not because I stop coming, because you stop coming. <laughs> Somebody just missed that. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> We stop having afternoon programs, not because I stop coming, because you stop coming. It don't bother me one bit, but watch this. Uh, time is an issue to some. Uh, it's not an issue to some, but it is an issue to unbelievers and people who are unsaved, unchurched, unplanted that we are really trying to reach. When church is over, you want people to be looking at their watch, and when they look at their watch, you don't want them to look. Uh, and say, man, when is this going to be over? You want them to be looking at their watch and say, man, I can't believe it's already over because it was that good. 
when you are really in worship, it makes the time go by faster. But because of this change, some people feel like your church has been stolen. But now that you know why, we ought to be able to bear the change a little bit more. Not only did we change communion and baptism, let's discuss this big elephant in the room. Let's talk about this church name. Everybody say the church name. Yeah, I understand why you feel the way you feel, Pastor. Uh, is, is us going to be Baptist anymore? What's all this? The star stuff. We used to be New Rising Star Missionary Baptist Church. Now, every time I hear you on the radio, every time we come on TV, follow the star. What's all this star stuff? And even when you don't say the star, you still don't say New Rising Star Missionary Baptist Church. Now you're saying New Rising Star Church. I want you to know our church name has not been changed. I, I want to be clear about that. It has not been changed. But this is why we say the star as a surname. This is why we say New Rising Star Church. Uh, if you're reading this while I'm talking, uh, you might miss what I'm about to say. There's a mother in here right now. You got a child. You name your child Christopher. But you call him Chris. <laughs> Does that mean legally his name is not Christopher anymore? <laughs> okay. Uh, there's another mother. Uh, you grew up somewhere else. Uh, you named your child Lakeisha. But you call Lakeisha. <laughs> Somebody else named their child William, but you call him Will. Why do you shorten their name? You shorten their name to make it easier for other people to connect with them and them to connect with other people. It's no different with the church. Although we are New Rising Star legally, Missionary Baptist Church, we call ourselves New Rising Star Church or we call ourselves the star to make it easier for people to connect to us. But a small change like this going unexplained can cause people to feel like somebody has stole their church. And I'm going to tell you this. This is me personally. This, this ain't got nothing to do with you. I know that we're New Rising Star Missionary Baptist Church. I don't want Missionary Baptist to be what we highlight. Now, now, I didn't take that off or call us New Rising Star Church because of what I wanted. I told you I did it to make it easier to connect with people. But, but I still don't want that to be what we highlight because as soon as you slap a label on it, I'm Baptist. I was born that way, but guess what? Some people are not born that way, and just that little bit can put a stigma on your church, whether it's Baptist, AME, Pentecostal, and cause some people never to walk through your doors because they think they already have you figured out. Now, that's me personally. Now, now why I did it is on the screen. I'm just, I'm just giving you my personal. Everybody understand what I'm saying? All right. Not only uh, has there been buzz about the church name, let, let's talk about worship. Everybody say worship. worship. Pastor, we ain't got deacons no more. We got deacons, you just don't see them doing devotion. Uh, we changed from deacons doing devotion to now we have a praise team. And, and a small change like that, unexplained, can cause some people to feel, you know what, I think somebody stole my church. I know it belongs to God, but, but I'm dealing with some real feelings. I think somebody stole my church. I have always said, and I'm going to say it again, people should serve where they are gifted. Somebody shout where they're gifted, not where there's a need. You know that you serve where you are gifted when people enjoy what you do and they don't have to endure what you do. Oh, suck it. All right, now let's clear the elephant up in the room. Uh, we got about 42 deacons, and about five of them, they can really sing. No joke. <laughs> now, I'm serious. Uh, Deacon Mac right there, he can pull it. Don't, don't let it fool you now. And he's the only one. We got some other ones who can really pull it. I'm talking about who can absolutely sing, but when everybody doing it, There'll be times I walk into the sanctuary, I get ready to door swing over, you know, the, the ushers be on their job. They be so diligently. <laughs> I walk through the door. It's a crowd trying to get through the door. I say, y'all, come on in. Let's, nah, we're going to wait till they finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Now watch this. The Bible says that all of us ought to be able to make a joyful noise. But if I don't have the gift of singing, I can just join in with everybody else. I don't necessarily have to lead worship. Now, the few who know they can sing, they can still sing. And if they ever say they want to shout at the praise team, then come on up. Because they can absolutely pull it. But if you know you can't lead people in worship and people are enduring what you do rather than enjoying what you do, everybody is a 10 at something. Find what you attend at and do that. All right. Somebody say, who stole my church, Pastor? Say it again. Who stole my church? All right. Here go another change. I got another one for you. I got another one for you. Uh, Pastor, we confused. Uh, we used to have, us had Sunday school. What's all this small group stuff? <laughs> you just changing everything. We, we used to have Sunday school. Now we use small groups instead of the word Sunday school. Small groups is the Sunday school model for discipleship. What is discipleship? It literally, uh, literally means to be a learner and a follower of Jesus Christ. Just because you come to church does not make you a disciple. The only people who are disciples are those who are really trying to be learners and followers of Jesus Christ. So watch this. Uh, small groups is the Sunday school model for discipleship on a daily basis that is geared towards teaching and relationships. So here are some differences between small groups and Sunday school. Uh, Sunday school, you only can do it on Sunday. Small groups, you can do it any day of the week, and it does not have to be in the church facility. Uh, you can do it in the park. You can do it at the restaurant. You can do it in somebody's house. Because watch this, you do it on a daily basis, not just one day a week. So the first change that we made, we just changed the name from Sunday school to small groups. Uh, and it was really, uh, it, was, it was Sunday school under the name of small groups. The only thing that changed at first was the name. Then this year we made another change. No longer does everybody have to use the Sunday school expositor. But now you have different topics that you can choose from that you want to learn about. What happens if I'm coming to church and my marriage is falling apart and I hear this message in the sanctuary, and it's a great message, but when I go to Sunday school, uh, it's, it's on Amos the prophet, and it ain't got nothing to do with my marriage. But I need some on my marriage. I should be able to choose based upon what it is that I need in my life at that particular moment in time. So guess what? We didn't take away Cornerstone. You still got it. Cornerstone is the traditional Sunday school model if you want to use the traditional Sunday school book. And there are some great teachings and great lessons within those books. You can't find better theologians than the people who wrote those books. But guess what? If you're dealing with something else, we're getting ready to go into our fall semester. We're going to have war room. We're going to have all kinds of other classes. Whatever you want to choose from, it will be at your disposal according to what you need in your life at that particular moment in time. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? Yes, but a small change like that, unexplained, has caused somebody to feel like somebody stole my church. Last but not least, I want to talk about what never changes. Everybody say what never changes. What never changes. Everybody say it again. What never changes. Amongst all of these changes, if you can remember this, you'll be able to stomach what has already been changed, what's being changed, and what may possibly be changed in the future. Because three things never change. Everybody repeat after me. The mission never changes. God never changes. The word never changes. Let's say it again with uplifted voices. The mission never changes. God never changes. The word never changes. All right, show me some scripture. Let me show you some scripture. Uh, Joshua chapter number one, there was a change in leadership from Moses to Joshua. Moses was the first leader of the children of Israel. Joshua was the second leader of the children of Israel. In Joshua chapter number one, God spoke to Moses, said, Moses, I uh, spoke to Joshua and said, Moses, my servant is now dead. Now you take all of these people, the children of Israel, cross over the Jordan and go into the promised land. The only thing that changed at that particular moment in time was the face of leadership, but three things didn't change. The mission didn't change. God didn't change. 
and the word didn't change. The new leader, Joshua, had the same mission as the old leader, Moses. You know, anytime there's a change in leadership, there's a time of, of tediousness and trepidation inside of the church because you want to know what new vision is this new boy bringing into us church? Ain't that what you want to know? But I want to tell you, I don't have a new vision because I can't take God's church, make my vision for his church and ask him to bless it. Only vision I have is the one he already gave years ago. So watch this. Under Moses, the vision was to get the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. Moses fell short of the promised land. Joshua got the baton. He didn't take it and run the other way. He didn't run in the opposite direction. He didn't go to the left or the right. He went further in the same direction till he got him into the promised land. Same vision of Moses, same vision of Joshua, same vision of Dr. Tommy Chappelle, same vision of Dr. Thomas Beavers. His vision was to save as many souls as possible. My vision is to save as many souls as possible. Number two, God didn't change. Joshua 1 verse number 5, God says to Joshua, as I was with Moses, I'll also be with you. The God of Moses was the God of Joshua. 2016, the God of Dr. Tommy Chappelle. Jesus Christ is the God of Dr. Thomas Beavers. God has not changed. Last but not least, the word has not changed. Joshua 1, verse number 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate therein both day and night and observe to do according to all that's written therein, for then you will make your way prosperous, then you will have good success. The same book that Moses went on the mountaintop and received from God. Same book he used, same book Joshua used. Same Bible Dr. Tommy Chappelle preached from and lived from is the same Bible Thomas Beavers preaches from and lives from. 